Since I was a little boy, every summer I'd go fishing with my family. And um, I would usually take a month or a month and a half off from chess, which was an interesting thing to do in that it would sort of give me a new perspective on it when I came back. Maybe I would study a little bit. But late, more lately in my career, I've given a lot of thought to whether or not it's good for me to continue doing so. And I think it's interesting for a player to take off a couple weeks every once in a while to get themselves back to a fresh perspective on the game. I'm not sure that such an extended period is so good because sometimes you find yourself going backwards and getting a little bit rusty. Um, this is the first tournament that I played after I went fishing with my family last summer in 97. And it was the Florida State Championship, played in Orlando, and I actually won the tournament, but they wouldn't call me the official Florida State Champion because I'm not from Florida, which was a real shame. Anyway, um, this was the third round game. My opponent's name was Dyson. My opponent played d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, e3. A slightly less aggressive continuation than the main line. Usually white will play c4 and challenge black center right away. But to do this, white usually needs to have a little bit of knowledge. They have to study the openings a little bit. And a lot of guys will avoid that, just try to play a strategical game without worrying about opening knowledge. He played e3. And usually in this position, I play the move c5 try to take sort of the advantage of white right away. In this game, for one re reason or another, I decided to play a different system. I played with c6. The idea of this move is sort of to see where wh white's next move will be before I decide how to develop my queenside bishop. I'm either going to come to f5 or g4, and the move c7, c6 will be a useful move later on in terms of strengthening my center. My opponent played bishop d3, and then I responded by coming bishop g4. So notice my last two moves. First of all, I saw where he was going to go, to d3, and then I went to g4. I pinned his knight on f3. If I had played bishop g4 right away, he would probably play bishop e2, and it would have been a little less convenient for me. So bishop d3, bishop g4. Notice how a slight improvement on a move order can help your development a little bit. He chased my bishop with h3. I played bishop h5. There's no reason for me to immediately take the knight on f3 because the game could open up and the bishop will, be, will be, probably be slightly better than the knight. And also in this structure, after I play bishop h5, you should take a moment and notice what the good bishops are and what the bad bishops are, because this is very important in almost all chess positions. The rule, which some of you may have heard, is that a bishop is a good bishop if your pawns are not locked on that color square and your opponents are. In other words, in the middle game and the opening, this usually relates to the center of the board. So if we look at the center of the board, in this position, if you look at the central pawn structure, white has pawns on d4 and e3, and black has a pawn on d5 and c6. What this would lead us to see is that white's light squared bishop on d3 could be considered his good bishop, and the bishop on c1 could be considered his bad bishop because it's locked in by its own pawns. White's bishop is, the d3 bishop is more active. Black, on the other hand, has a bishop on h5, which would be my bad bishop, but in fact it's very active. It's outside of my pawn structure. So you can see that already, if I consider my moves like just simply e6 and my bishop comes out to d6 or something, you'll see that my quote-unquote bad bishop on h5 is outside of my pawn structure and can come to g6 and offer a trade with his good bishop, while his bad bishop is locked inside of his pawn structure. In closed games, it's often very good to put your bishop outside of the structure before it closes off. So now we can see that that relationship will give me a slight advantage in this game, my pawn structure. So if my opponent were to continue to chase the bishop to get away from the pin on this 9 and f3 with g4, after I play bishop g6, the trade that would, be, that would follow would be to my advantage, because this is my bad bishop and his good bishop. After bishop h5, my opponent castled. I played knight bd7, normal developing move. He played knight bd2. One little thing to note about the position is that my opponent has already committed his king to the king side, and I have not yet decided where my king is going to go. Maybe the center of the board will explode. Maybe I'm going to try to castle king side also. Maybe I'm going to go queen side and attack him on the king side. So his king is already fixed to one location while my king has more flexibility. And since the center isn't opening up so quickly, there's not so much danger. In an open center, you want to, you want to castle your king to a safe position relatively quickly. When the game is closed, a lot of the time, you can maintain flexibility and decide a little bit later. I played e6. And my opponent played e4, a central move which I think is a small mistake. Now, at first we can see that e4 makes sense, because my opponent's taking a little more space in the middle of the board. His bishop on c1 is coming alive. But the problem with this move is that it gives me the option of winning the two bishops. And since e4 opens up the position, winning the two bishops is good. As I've described before, 
Bishops are slightly better than knights in an open game. My opponent is opening the game and at the same time allowing me to win his bishop. It's not so clear. Maybe you could take a moment and try to figure out what I mean. I play d takes e4, knight takes e4, and here I played knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, knight f6. This may not seem like a big deal to you, but in fact it is. I'm attacking his bishop on e4, threatening simply to take it and win the two bishops. The point is that if he can't retreat, if he goes bishop to d3, I can remove the defender and win the d4 pawn. Do you see how? I simply play bishop takes f3, and after queen takes f3, queen takes d4, black has won a pawn. So his central thrust e4 was slightly premature because I was able to play this idea, and now he has to give me one of his two bishops. He played bishop g5, pinning my knight, which is attacking his e4 bishop. I played the move bishop e7, blocking the pin. Now the attack on his bishop on e4 is rejuvenated. My opponent decided not to give away his light squared bishop, but his dark squared bishop. His logic makes some sense because we've, dis we've discussed what is the good bishop and what is the bad bishop. His central pawn is on d4, which would lead one to believe that his good bishop is the light squared bishop and his bad bishop is the dark squared bishop. These rules have got to be followed with an understanding of the fact that there are many exceptions to them. In this position, his d4 pawn could become a weakness, so one could make the argument that it would be better for him to have a dark squared bishop to defend it. Always when you look at these rules of good bishop, bad bishop, knights or bishops, which one are better, have an understanding that it could be an exception. There are many exceptions in chess. My opponent played bishop takes f6. Now take a moment and try to figure out what you would do here. I have two different options here. The first and most natural move is bishop takes f6. I keep a very solid pawn structure. I'm pressuring his d4 pawn. I'm threatening, in fact, to win it right away by trading bishop takes f3 and then taking on d4. My opponent would probably play c3. This position is very good for black, but maybe not better. Unclear. I have the two bishops, and in return, he has a little more central control. The position is about equal. This is one good option. I made a different decision. I played g takes f6. Now, you may be thinking about right now, wait a minute, in the last game I saw against Peter, Josh had the white pieces again in a very similar pawn structure, and he said that this was good for white. And I won the game, if you recall, pretty quickly. What I want you to draw from this game is that there are exceptions to every rule, and that to think that one structure is always bad is a big mistake. You have to be flexible when you play a chess game. In this position, it's different. There are some little differences which define the position. For one thing, in my game against Peter, my, my structure was like this. I had a fiendshed or bishop. If you recall, I also discussed black wasn't able to use the open g-file because of the configuration of the h2, g3, f2 pawn blockade. My king was very safe. If you go back to the, my position now, the white bishop is on e4, and the pawns are on g2 and h3, which means that white's king position is much looser. The reason I play g takes f6 is that I want to attack him on the g-file, also, I can play the move f5 to force his bishop away. If you recall, in the game against Peter, the dark square bishop was a big weakness for black. Now it's a fantastic piece. For white to play the move g4 and kick my bishop off of this pin would be a big mistake because it would leave his king wide open to attack. Otherwise, after I play f5, my bishop will be here forever, combined with a rook on g8 and an eventual castle and queen set and doubling of rooks on the g2 square. I'm going to build up a very fierce attack. I showed this position to a strong international master recently, after bishop takes f6, and I asked him, what would you do? His response, after thinking for a few minutes, was, I'd, I'd play bishop takes f6 here. I, said, I think that g takes f6 is the correct move. The immediate response is to play the most natural decision, but here, I take advantage of, this, of the little nuances in white's position to begin a big attack. My opponent played c3, strengthening his center. Watch how I began to attack now. My first move was queen d6. My plan is to castle queenside and line up on the g-file. Also moves like queen f4 are threatened now. If you think about three, a three-move combination for black, if I got in queen f4, bishop d6, and bishop takes f3, queen h2 would be checkmate coming. My opponent has to worry about a lot of things. Also, we talked about the fact that it's much easier to attack a position that has a weakness. My opponent's pawn on h3 is a big weakness because he cannot play g3 and believe in the solidity of his position because now 
the H3 square would be weak and the G3 square would be weak and the F3 square would be weak. It's very hard for him to defend his kingside. After queen d6, my opponent played rook e1. I castled. Now, when I played g takes f6, it was an attacking decision. I didn't immediately follow, the, follow that move by lunging forward. I'm simply improving my position. I see that white can't do so much, and I'm coming at him. Rook e1, I castled. Patience. The attack is about to begin. b4. Now, when you see this move, you probably are thinking back to the Peter game. This looks surprisingly similar to that position. And when I was white, I undermined the black castle queenside position with the idea of b4 and b5. What's different in this position is that black has much more time. The timing is completely different. Black's attack is coming faster. So what I want you to think about, looking at how my attack progressed in this game, is that when evaluating a pawn structure, you must not look at the pawns and stop think that that defines everything. You have to notice every little nuance of a position. Here, the open G file on white's weak and king position is more important than my slight pawn weaknesses and the fact that white is coming with b4 and b5. I played rook hg8, the beginning of my storm in the G file. And here my opponent started to feel a lot of danger. First of all, you should notice that if he plays g4, he would not be succeeding at all in closing off the G file. I would play f5. He can't take my bishop on h5 because of the pin on the g-file. This, by the way, would have held true the move before. If he had played g4, I could have then played rook g8. He can't take on h5 because of the pin, and I'm going to open up the g-file. White has to be very careful before pushing pawns in front of his king now. After rook g8, my opponent saw my threats of rook g7 and rook g8. Also saw the fact that I was thinking about playing queen to f4 with the idea of bishop d6. He was very concerned with his position. He played king f1. Already he's running. Now the idea of this move is for one thing, he wants to unpin his g2 pawn, which means maybe he wants to play the move g4. It's very important to notice the little subtleties of each position. The most logical way for me to continue my attack is to play rook g7. My opponent's last move, king f1, was a very good defensive move, which had some spice to it. If I play rook g7, my most natural buildup, his idea was to play g4. Now the g-pawn is no longer pinned. My bishop is attacked, has to go back to g6. And after he takes on g6, if I take with my h-pawn, my rook on g7 looks ridiculous. And if I take with the rook, I've lost some time in my attack. It's not doing anything yet. Rook g7 would, would be imprecise. First, I played f5. A slight improvement in my position that doesn't allow his defensive idea. Bishop d3. What did I do now? Rook g7, the logical buildup of the attack. Queen a4, what would you do now? Of course, when our opponent makes a move, we have to think, what was his threat? He has many ideas with this position. First of all, if you recall from the game against Peter, the bishop that sat on h5 was very effective on when it was pinning the knight on f3. But once the queen moved, the knight could move. Now, what I mean by that is that after queen a4, my opponent is considering a move like knight e5, leaving the bishop on h5, doing nothing, trying to block my queen on d6 out, for, out of the game and to begin a quick queenside attack. So while the first inclination after a move like queen a4 would be to defend the a7 pawn, a move like a6 or king b8, we have to be careful. His next move may be knight e5. My bishop on h5 is a very effective piece, but if left there a little too long, it could lose its power. In positions of opposite side castling, a lot of the time the game comes to one side attacking and the other side counterattacking. As opposed to attack and defense, sometimes it's a kind of race, one side at the other side. To win this race effectively, a lot of the time you're going to have to make a very specific decision. You're going to have to calculate confidently. Also, when your opponent attacks you, there are two principal ways of responding. One is defense, and another is counterattack. My opponent's idea with queen a4 challenged me. Will I defend my a7 pawn, or will I run at him? seeing that I can go faster. My first move is bishop takes f3, not allowing his knight to leave the square. I should note that if he takes on a7, it wouldn't mean anything. After bishop takes g2 check, I'm attacking him, and I'm up a piece. He took back, g takes f3. Now we can feel that white's king is looking very loose. What would you do now? A certain kind of position has come upon the board. Bishops of opposite color. My bishop on e7 is a dark square bishop and his bishop on d3, a light square bishop. Bishops of opposite color positions 
are very unique. In the middle game, one of the first rules in these types of positions is that attack, initiative, is the most important thing. Because the bishops can never meet, they do separate tasks, it tends to create a situation in which there's a race. So often, pawns don't matter so much. In a bishop opposite color position, a lot of the time, one player will sacrifice a pawn or two or even three to open up your opponent's king to begin an attack. And an attack with a bishop opposite color can be very dangerous. Here my a7 pawn is, is attacked. If I defend by a move like king b8, he'll play b5, and suddenly his attack is starting to come. I don't want to give him any time. I left the pawn on a7 and attacked queen h2. My opponent played queen takes a7. What is my idea? Did you think that my idea was here to play queen takes h3 check? Remember, pawns are not so important. The key weakness in his game is not that square. After queen takes h3 check, king e2, his king is surprisingly safe in the center. Now moves like queen a8 check are coming. My king is a little bit under attack. Things can go the wrong way. Think about the reality that in this position we have bishop's op as a color. Notice a weak square in his game. Take a moment, hit pause. What do you think I played? One square in his position which I can attack more than he can defend is the f2 square. His bishop can have nothing to do with it. I played rook g2. It was this move that I saw when I played bishop takes f3. Of course, I, I analyzed all of his checks. If queen a8 check, I would easily play king c7, attacking his queen. After queen a5 check, king d7, he has no more effective checks. Now he has to deal with the f2 square. His only way to defend it is rook e2, which has a big downside of taking away that square from the king to escape. Black has three mates in one. Rook g1 mate, queen g1 mate, or queen h1 mate. My opponent decided to defend the f2 square with d5. A very good move, but unfortunately it's too late. If I quickly check him with queen g1 check or rook g1 check, he comes up to the e2 square and his king is pretty safe. Remember, f2 is the focal point in my attack. What did I do? Do you remember we've been talking about bishops of opposite color? The f2 square? Does he have enough checks? Calculate. What did I play? Bishop h4. I'm leaving my king to fend for himself because I've calculated that white doesn't have enough checks. Let's take a look. Queen a8 check? No problem. King c7. If my opponent were to play d6 check now, I would simply take with the rook, and he's out of checks. His only move is queen a5 check. And here I have a number of ways to get out of everything. The most effective is probably simply b6 blocking. After queen a7 check, I could play king d6. He has no more good checks. F2 is hanging. He's going to get mated. While my king might look a little precarious on d6, his hourglass has run out. Mate is coming soon. My opponent played queen a8 check, king c7, and he resigned. There's no way to defend f2 anymore. So now that you've seen two different games in roughly the same pawn structure, why don't you go back and take a look at them again? Notice in the first one, I took advantage of black's weak and queen side to attack. My king was safe. In the second one, white's king side was a little bit weaker, and I took advantage of that to attack. Go over in your mind how small subtleties of position can be very important in the evaluation of the pawn structure. Also, I want you to give some thought to the nature of the position when there are bishops of opposite color. The attacks come very quickly, very forcefully. Don't be materialistic when you have to rush. When you have to run at your opponent, you have to do it.